Hey, what's going on? This is George here from Lucia. On today's episode, we have Mike Connolly here, SVP for EverQuote. Um, Mike originally started off his, you know, his career as a computer engineer and found his way through sales where he's one of the biggest leaders today in the industry. Um, so I'd love for you all to welcome Mike. How's it going today, Mike? Thanks for joining. Oh, it's going great, George. Thanks for having me. All right, my pleasure is mine. Um, so why don't we start off by, you know, you give yourself a quick introduction, letting our viewers and listeners here know a little bit more about yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, so Mike Conley, uh, as you mentioned, uh, currently uh, Senior Vice President of Sales and Customer Success at EverQuote. Uh, prior to that, I spent five years at Cargurus. Uh, nice run there from a pre-IPO to post-IPO and a lot of growth, a lot of learnings myself there, uh, which is really my first true startup company I worked at. Um, and as you mentioned, early in my career, I went to school for computer engineering, spent the first couple of years of my life uh, in that world, which I think from a very young age, I thought that's what I wanted. Um, you know, like math, science was always kind of my, my sweet spot, my wheelhouse. Uh, got my degree there, got my, my career started there. And like you mentioned, kind of just, uh, you know, accidentally, fortunately, uh, some mix between the two, found myself on the sales side of the house. And I love it here now, but it's, uh, it's been a journey. And what happened there? Were you just sick of salespeople closing deals, taking credits for, you know, the sales engineer coming in there and kind of doing the whole thing about, you know, showing the value, showing customers how the tool actually works. And that kind of, you know, made you think, all right, maybe I can actually do this and I can actually close deals too. No, it's, uh, it, it really got pushed on me. Um, so I was in a more of a customer facing engineering role uh, not quite sales engineered, you know, definitely didn't have the sales component to it, but I was working with customers. Um, actually, our VP of sales at the time, a company Paytech, uh, noticed that I think especially for an engineer where, you know, sometimes the stereotype fits. He's like, hey, like, you know, it seems like it worked pretty well with customers. Uh, have you ever thought about sales? And I was like, no, like, I definitely have never thought about sales. I had uh, a perception or a connotation of what a sales rep was and you know, it's kind of what you see in you know, movies or television of the, the stereotypical, slimy, sleazy, pushy, arrogant, um, all things that I don't think I consider myself in, in that profile. And I honestly didn't know enough about sales to, you know, really know the difference or know the truth. Uh, so I would be in sales meetings, uh, you know, kind of as like the, the true engineer in the room and talk. Nice. That's awesome. And then, you know, what have you seen, like, since you made that transition into sales, right? Then you did realize that these, you know, types of uh, stigmas that are held on salespeople, that, you know, they're slimy, they're, they're greedy, they're kind of just looking to get after the money. Um, what was like the kind of the main identifying factor for you to realize that it's really not, you know, really tied to that stigma? It was completely different than that. Um, it took a lot of convincing from a lot of different people. Um, I had uh, that same VP, you know, kind of talk to me about his approach to sales of being a lot more consultative, being a, a partner, um, the ability to be honest and, and help people solve problems, which honestly, you know, sounded great on paper. It also sounded a little cliche. Um, and I didn't know in practice if that's how, you know, sales was actually executed, uh, but got to know more people on the sales team, kind of just organically in the office um, and got to see, you know, their different approaches. And you know, to be fair, some people did take that more stereotypical, aggressive approach, and that's how they got to their number. And I think that was okay for them. Uh, but I met a lot of people who their personality didn't seem to fit my perception of what a sales rep was. Um, and, and again, you know, as a sales rep, I, I realized these cliches and in hindsight. Um, may seem pretty uh, They still... Uh, they seemed invested in helping their customers. So I think that's where I started to get like the seed of, okay, like maybe there is something to this that there's many ways you can do this job and you can do it with integrity in a way that you can be happy with yourself with. I agree too. And I think you brought up a good point. I think a lot of people have different approaches, especially in sales. There are, you know, people that are just the lone wolves that kind of just gets things done don't need to collaborate much, don't need to meet with their managers before they send out every, every email or every email before they join every call, but kind of figure out a way to do it on their own. But then there's also people that can thrive in different types of environment. Um, 
what, what did you like learn throughout your career that has been you know significant for you um, between people's different types of approaches? Approaches. I'm sorry. Was there something that stuck out that that kind of related to all of them in mind, or was it all different and based on everyone else's different styles? I think for me personally, I realized this as I started in sales, I was stealing like bits of approaches and, and bits of talk tracks from everyone I met, right? So I wouldn't consider myself introverted. I also wouldn't consider myself extroverted, right? I think I was somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Um, you know, and maybe as a salesperson, I actually probably lent a little bit too much to the side of empathetic um, and, and not aggressive enough, right? Like not asking for the deal, uh, not asking the tough questions that maybe you don't want the answer to, but you need to get those answers to, to move the deal along. Um, I think that's where I learned from some of the people who may have been more of like the stereotypical sales rep of, you know, how do you get comfortable with being uncomfortable? Um, how do you feel comfortable asking those tough questions? Um, realizing as a salesperson, it's a good thing to hear now, right? You want to hear the truth. You want to know exactly what's happening on the prospect or customer side so you can solve that problem or, or over, overcome that objection. Um, and I think for me, you know, leading sales teams now, a big piece that I've stuck to is letting people be successful within, you know, their, their own personality and their own approach and their own structure uh, that you don't need to have everyone do the role the same way. Uh, that's one thing is I've really come to enjoy about sales is that is as an engineer, there typically is a very binary right answer or wrong answer or yes, no, or uh, success or failure. And sales, I think early on for me was intimidating that there's so much gray area in between there. Um, but over time, that became the fun space where you can take any number of approaches to be successful uh, and really trying to help you know people on the sales team and you know especially in, the, in their careers. I know you work with BDRs. Um, of how do they find that own style for themselves that is authentic and, you know, they feel comfortable with and they can be successful with and then kind of stretching out a little bit, you know, like for myself, if I was a little bit too much on the empathetic side, you know, how do I move a little bit more towards, um, I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but a little bit more outgoing, a little bit more direct, um, a little bit more, again, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and you know, same thing, we've had some very successful sales reps who, might be their tendencies are a little bit more on the aggressive side, you know, and how do you get a little bit more customer empathy? How do you soften it up a little bit? But you're not trying to make everyone the same, right? Like you're trying to have someone operate the way that they operate best, but just expand their horizons a bit to incorporate other styles. Um, but to me, that's a really fun way. And if I think about our, our top team members, you know, they're all over the place in how they approach the role. And to me, that's really fun, right? You're not trying to change someone. You're just trying to help them expand a little bit. I agree with you. And I think, you know, I think everyone in sales can definitely relate to it. We've all taken things and made it our own. We've learned it from people we sat next to, leaders that we've had, people that, you know, have made mistakes in front of us or also had really good conversations with, with customers too. Um, you know, from, from a leader's perspective though, like how do you create that kind of environment where people can share tips and, and kind of have their own motivations and in, in different ways that they achieve success, but you know, they're sharing it with each other, they're making it their own, and they're not all sounding like the same people reading out of a script. Yeah, to me, I, I think that's really enabling the managers to be great coaches, right? I, I know that when I moved into leadership, I definitely fell into the camp, I think a lot of first time leaders do of, hey, here's how I did the job, here's how I was successful. This is probably really the only method I truly understand. So let to be just like me, right? And do the things that I did and, and say the things that I said. And, you know, it didn't take me too long to realize like that's not going to be successful, right? Uh, but it is more challenging, you know, if, if me and you're working together and, and you're trying to, to coach me, how do you make me a better version of me versus, you know, trying to clone the things that you do best, that you know best? Um, and to me, that was definitely a learning process. Uh, and now, like when we work with our leadership development group here at Everquote, or if I'm, I'm talking to other people who are trying to get into leadership, we put a lot of focus on that area of you're not trying to you know, take your best practices and just operationalize those across a whole bunch of different people. You really need to understand what are their individual motivations, what are they good at, what are their op opportunities, and you know, what you're coaching them to be might be very different than what you're coaching the person next to them to be. Um, but that's a challenge. If you're managing a team of 10 people, you might have 10 very different approaches that you're taking. And 
Uh, that's certainly a lot more challenging than if you just have a recipe of saying, here's what makes a good sales rep. We're just going to do the same thing with all 10 people. Certainly easier to execute that, but I think almost certainly not going to be as successful. I, I think I'm agreeing with you too, like on that, because I'm, I'm starting to realize it a lot more now. Um, everyone has their own pace and their style to it. Their own, you know, they, then you start to develop your own swagger to having that conversation, you know, with a client. Some people are, you know, aggressive, pushy. Some people are laid back, but then there's people that take their time, think before they speak or very calm and have their own different ways of controlling the call. And I, I definitely agree. I think, I think everyone has, everyone has different sales skills in them. It's just a matter of like, how do we bring it out of them as sales leaders? Um, you know, from a leader perspective, I know, uh, spoke to a lot of people. I looked at some uh, feedback people left you on your, on your LinkedIn. Henry says great things about you. I mean, how do you, how do you develop good leaders, you know, from, from moving from an individual contributor to a leader themselves? What, what does that path look like and how do we prepare people for it? Yeah. So I think one of the first things I learned is that being a manager or a leader is very different than being an individual contributor. And I, I think early on in my career, I fell into another trap of here's my best salesperson, you know, let's move that person into management. And then realizing, you know, the, the skills and behaviors that make you a great salesperson may or may not make you a great leader. Um, so I think that was one aspect of just, you know, kind of profiling who are the right people to move in. Um, I think it's really questioning why someone wants to move to leadership. Because a lot of times when you really dig under the hood, it's either money, which is fine. I, I completely respect, you know, people wanting to, to make more money. But if that's the reason you're getting into leadership, it's probably not going to be a recipe for success as well. Um, and then it's it's really behavioral, right? It's like, do you have do you have patience? Uh, you know, the ability to work with people, um, things that are hard to really quantify. Like, do you have the ability to inspire? Right? Are people going to be motivated to work with you and work for you? Um, and those are really hard things to measure. Um, but I, I think you see it. Um, if, if we can swear on this podcast, uh, <laughs> I have something that we call the uh, the no shit promotion, right? And that actually became like my defining mechanism for, are we moving the right person into leadership? Is, will their teammates look at that and say, no shit, of course they're promoting George, right? He's done X, Y, Z. He's a leader on the floor already. Um, of course he should be moving to, to leadership. And maybe George isn't number one on the stack rankings, right? Maybe he's number two, maybe he's number three, maybe he's number four. But those things that define a good leader, like he is number one in those rankings, even if those aren't an individual contributor sales stack ranking, the team just knows it, right? They, they see it on the floor. Um, how do you work with new employees, right? Are you, you know, do you take it as a healthy competition of, hey, here's someone on the team, let me help ramp them up and help them make successful. And you know, I'm, I'm just creating more competition for myself. Um, or do you get a little bit selfish and kind of hold your cards a little bit closer to your vest of, I don't know. The, this this new woman seems like she's really got her stuff together. I don't know if I want to give her too many tips, right? Because she's going to move past me, and we're competing for the same promotions and uh, competing for the you know the same incentives, et cetera. And for an individual contributor, like that's not the type of person that I, I want to to be within the the team and within the culture. But that can drive success, right? I think a lot of people have like those self motivations where it's I need to be the best. I need to be number one, and I think that motivation is great as long as it's not so far to the extreme that you're also you know, trying to hold other people down. Um, and I think you see it as you interact with people who are the ones who are really invested in the team, in the company. Uh, they're willing to help others. They're willing to, um, we, I think Henry can speak about this. We saw this a lot of car gurus. I think probably the best definition of the culture we had there, and I think the culture we had there was phenomenal was we were talking before the podcast started about end of month pressures and kind of getting to your number and, you know, sometimes literally going down to midnight on the 30th to, or the 31st to, to get there. And one thing we saw every month at CarGurus, and I've never seen it anywhere else, is we would consistently have a full sales floor until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night on the last day of the month. But there would be a lot of people who were already at their number helping other people get to their number. Like they were literally making calls on other people's customers. Uh, they were, you know, being a second voice on those calls to help get them across the finish line when there was no, you know, personal gain for them at all. There was no commission. There was no board credit. The only thing they were getting out of it was helping a teammate get to their goal. 
And by and large, like that's what people did. And, and to me, like that was the most selfless I've seen a sales floor. I think it really reinforced that, you know, one way or another, we had, we had built a really strong culture and people could still be very competitive. We had a very competitive environment, but it was healthy competition, right? It wasn't, I'm going to try to hold my teammate down. It's going to be, let's all be the best we can possibly be. And by the way, we're still racing. Like I'm, I'm still going against everyone here, but it doesn't mean I have to hold you back. Like you can help me. I can help you. compete and in fact with the team is doing sorry the uh the connection broke out again while, while you were wrapping up but i think I, I did definitely get the message um i think it comes down to like you know people being self oh, you just came back on my head oh no no worries i i, I think i did get the point though i think it comes down to like people being self-motivated inspired to kind of help out and be, you need to carve out your own path at the end of the day if you really want to be a leader you got to step up when someone needs you. Someone needs help. You got to be able to offer yourself and, and you know offer that help. But it can't be just to get to that end goal. You have to truly you know be be wanting to help someone, right? Not just doing it just to get the check, just to check off the box and say, all right, this person's a team player, kind of thing. Yeah, that, that that's a really good point. One thing I was gonna say is, I think for like if you're looking at first time managers a lot of times you probably don't really need to interview for that, right? Like the people who are going to be the right fit for that role have already been, been a leader on the floor for a period of time. They've demonstrated that they've gotten themselves into the, that no shit promotion, uh, you know, realm already. Um, but you're right. I think that there is a distinguishing factor there of, are you doing those things just because you know, you're supposed to do those things if you want to get into leadership or are you doing them because you truly believe it's the right thing to do and you want to help people, right? And the motivation behind it is important. And that can certainly get really fuzzy to really understand, you know, is this person doing it because they saw that the five people who got promoted to management before them did that. So it's okay, well, I'm gonna have to make some calls to my teammates and I'm gonna have to lead a coaching session. I really don't want to, and maybe I'll still hold some of the good stuff back versus truly being invested in that process. And also enjoying it, right? I think you have to get self-satisfaction from helping others as a leader. I think that's you know kind of a defining characteristic of being a good leader. I agree with you. Now, I mean, what happens in situations where, I mean, this is completely different. I feel like at a smaller company, it's very easy to kind of stand up, wear that hat, and just try to help out as much as you can. And the good thing about it is that your work is being rewarded. People are seeing it because it's happening at, at a much, you know, it's happening right in front of you. It's closer. Um, you're closer to that line of business. Um, whereas that if you're working at a, a bigger organization, sometimes for, for an individual contributor themselves, they could be doing it out of goodwill because they really, really want to help out the team get there. But it, it's really tough because a lot of times it's not seen by the leadership team above. They might not be seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis, the Slack messages you're sending, you calling someone on their cell phone at five o'clock on the last day of the month to see how, how it's going, if there's any way you can help out. I mean, like, how do you do it for at a bigger company compared to a smaller company? Do you just have to put yourself out there and let your leadership team know, or do you wait on a tap on the shoulder? Just It's a waiting game. It, it's a great question. Uh, for me, I have always been very uncomfortable with self-promotion. Right. So if I'm doing something like I don't want to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, George, look what I just did. Right. Like Mike is great. Look how awesome I am. Like that's just not my personality. And, and that's probably impacted me in my career at different points of, you know, not, you know, purposely not trying to put myself in the spotlight. Right. Um, one thing that's worked really well I've seen here at Everquote is we have a lot of different mechanisms of recognizing other people. Right. Whether it's people on your team, people uh, who are peers, people who are above you. So a lot of the situations you just talked about, right? So like those quick slacks of checking in on people or making a call for someone, um, the, the things that maybe even a frontline manager won't see or won't be exposed to all the time, um, a lot of times those will get called out by the people who receive the help, right? Because we give enough different avenues that people can recognize each other and that if you, you know, really take advantage of those and celebrate those, I think that's a really good way to see things rise to the top.
Um, we have a good example here, a woman on our team, Sarah, she is just consistently called out across every recognition mechanism we have by a whole slew of different people. And even though I don't work that closely with Sarah on a day-to-day -day basis, I can see from, from my spot that she's clearly doing all those right things, right? Because she's getting that feedback from her peers, from her leaders, cross-functionally from different departments. Um, and those things don't happen by accident, right? So I think that gives you another data point or another viewpoint into, especially in a, in a COVID distributed world where I think it's even that much harder um, of who are doing those things. Um, something else that we put together here at Everquote was a, a formal leadership development program. Uh, so this is for anyone who's an individual contributor uh, who's thinking about getting into leadership. And it's a six month program, it's pretty intensive. We, we do a mentorship, we do projects, we do classroom learnings. I actually have a session right after uh, this podcast uh, recording. Uh, I have another former colleague from Cargurus and she's gonna speak to the team about giving effective feedback because I know for, for me moving into leadership, giving people effective feedback or especially tough feedback was something I was not very good at. It was something that I honestly avoided in some situations. So we're trying to give the team exposure to all those things that you may not think about, right? If you're a top performing individual contributor and you're like, I want to move to leadership, like I want to have the big title, I want to make the big bucks, I want to have the recognition. And it's really trying to give, and, and those things can certainly happen and those things will certainly come, but there's all these other things that come with it, right? Like all of the, all the bad things and tough things about the job because it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword and really trying to pressure test people of why do you think you want to go into leadership? Let's give you as much exposure to it as we possibly can. And I think there's a couple of different positive outcomes that can come from that. Like one is you really prepare someone for leadership. And so when they do make that move in their career, they're more ready and more prepared than they otherwise would be. And, and they have certainly a better initial experience than I did and, and better results than I did. Um, so that's one positive outcome. The other one we've seen is that people go through that program and they say, you know what? I don't want to be a leader. Like I've learned like more about the aspects of the job and, you know, like the stresses of driving results through other people and not owning your own number um, and giving tough feedback and doing performance reviews and exiting people from a business and having to tell someone that their source of income is no longer there. And all those things that are really, really tough about leadership you know, just being a little bit more graphic and a little bit more explicit about, you know, this is what the role is. Um, and if someone goes through that and says, you know what, I can be an individual contributor, I can go on an enterprise sales track, there's a bunch of different ways I can continue to advance my career and make more money in a, in a role that's more appropriate for me and that's going to be more aligned with what I am good at and what I enjoy doing, then that's a great outcome too. Um, and we probably see right now like a 70 30 split where i think 70 people really kind of come out jazzed up and reinforced of like yep leadership's definitely what i want to do and maybe they're a little bit more uh ready for it and 30 percent say yeah thanks but no thanks that's that sounds like it's not worth and, and not exactly what i thought it was and you know hopefully like that's a good step for them as well because their next career step is now something that's a better fit for them that they're going to be more successful in yeah, I, I love that you have the uh, leadership mentorship program because it kind of gives you, I mean, practice makes perfect, right? It gives you a little bit of practice, a little taste of what it's going to be like in reality before you really dig your heels and get into it. Um, I was talking to a company called Rainmakers, and it's one of the co-founders for it is um, one of the uh, marketing professors at Bryant Universities. And what they're doing right now is they've created a program where it's a combination of AI and, and technologies where students are actually doing mock calls with a computer um, and getting scored on it based on their discovery check questions, uh, their ability to close, their ability to negotiate, and then getting some tips and, and, and feedback on how they can better themselves. So that way, when they're graduating out of college, they've already done over 200 or even 300 role plays. Um, yep. And I think that goes in to show that you know, the next generation of salespeople graduating out of college might be a lot more equipped than what we've been re used for because sales has always been, you know, not that many colleges have sales departments in them, number one. Now it's becoming the minor or even a major at some universities. So it, it's becoming a, like a, an actual career. Well, it, it's been a career, but it's becoming more of a career that people are actually being, um, you know, excited or even um, 
enticed to join for because there, there is a pretty good transition and career growth path in it. So, you know, from a, from a leadership perspective, how do you inspire the type of environment where people feel like, you know, they are able to, you know, learn and grow. They're able to, you know, start drilling in and learning about different lines of the businesses to see like where they want to actually progress internally. Is that more on the actual individual themselves having those goals and us tying those goals directly with that path? Or does it have to do with like us as leaders to kind of put that, put something together where there is a track to grow the career from there? Uh, another good question. I would say it's more on leaders, right? And I think a lot of other people would disagree with me. And, and I think there is a lot of momentum today around it. It's around an individual contributor to own their career path and own their development. And, and maybe it's just from my own personality and, and knowing been in that seat that, again, I was someone who wasn't comfortable with what I call self-promotion, right? And there's ways to own your career path that you're not self-promoting and you're not bragging, right? You can do it in the right way. Uh, but where I've moved up in my career, and, and maybe I was just lucky to have some very great invested leaders ahead of me, it was more the tap on the shoulder, right? It was that sales VP coming to me and saying, hey, I think you should try sales. I think you'd be good at it, right? And it was something I never even considered. And if he didn't tap me on the shoulder, I can guarantee I never would have explored sales on my own, right? I had this barrier that I will never be a salesperson. It's not the right role for me. I don't want to be a salesperson. Uh, but it took a leader who had experience to teach me that there was more to that role than I than I thought there was. Um, what we do at Everquote is we we try to give our teams as much ability as possible to own their their career development and teach them how to do that. Um, so we have what's called a um, attributes for success, and what this is is a monthly review with with every manager and, and their direct reports. Uh, there's roughly 15 different criteria that they're judged on a monthly basis that are directly tied to our career matrix, which says, here's every role that we have in our organization, and here's the criteria to be promoted from the role you're in to this next role. And then we have these monthly check-ins where it's, here's all the criteria that you're being judged against for your promotion, and let's mutually agree on where are you on each one, and the rep you know, kind of submits where they believe they are, the manager gives their evaluation. And hopefully if, if they're working together well, you're gonna triangulate some place pretty close. Uh, if not, they talk about that and kind of figure out where the disconnect is, but it's really on that rep, you know, we give them the tools, we give them you know, the very specific detailed criteria of what they need to do, but it's on them to do that. Um, in terms of creating the environment, uh, something that's been very simple for me is making sure that we celebrate when someone moves on, right? So. You know, as a leader, you never want to be territorial of, hey, here's a top performer. I have to keep them in my org. The right fit for that person may not be in your org or their long-term or even you know, short-term career aspirations may be outside your org. And to me, I think there is an entire spectrum of how supportive leaders can be, right? It can be, you know what, you're allowed to look, but I'm not really going to help you out, right? And like that's opening up a world to them. Um, or as my manager here at Everquote says, you can truly lean into it, right? And if someone is looking to do something different or take something else on, how do you proactively support that? How do you make the introductions to uh, facilitate them potentially moving to a different department? And then, you know, if they do get that role and, and move outside of your org, like truly celebrating that, right? It's one thing to say that you want to support people's career development and help them explore different opportunities and get to different places. It's another one to really live that. And you know, when you have the opportunity when it happens, you know, showing no regrets, you know, showing no sadness, knowing that, yep, you've just created more work for yourself, right? You're gonna have to backfill an extremely talented person with someone else and ramp them up, but you did the right thing for that employee and, and you got them to where they needed to be um, and celebrate that. And then I think another step is, you know, what I call external promotion. So you know, kind of just a, uh, a nice way of saying someone left the business for, for someone else. But that can be a positive, right? I think a lot of times people can take it personally if they leave the business or especially if they leave your team. Uh, you know, there's definitely a maxim out there that people don't leave companies, they leave managers. I don't believe that. Um, I know I've never left a company because of my manager. And honestly, my manager was probably the thing that was keeping me most <laughs> to not leave that company. Um, but sometimes the next best opportunity for someone might be at a different company. 
Uh, whether it's a role that you can't offer, it's a promotion you don't have available today, it's a department that we don't have, whatever the, those things may be, you know, like I always want our team to be looking at every opportunity they have internal within our org, you know, internal within our company, but you know, maybe outside of our org and then outside our company. Um, and then when those moves happen, you know, support them, help them, help them get there, help them make the right decision, right? It's not, you know, you're just trying to say, you know, push everyone else out. I think a part of a leader's job is to really qualify, you know, what are you looking for? Why are you looking? Um, I've definitely seen situations where people, I think, are reacting emotionally to a short-term challenge in a business where they see something they don't like or didn't go quite right. And they almost mentally say, hey, it's time for me to move on. And it's okay. Like, I completely get that reaction, right? Like, we're all human beings. We, we all have an emotional scale that we, we operate on. But, you know, like, can we take a logical step back and kind of measure the sum of the parts, right? And, and the entire opportunity you have here in your career path here and your development opportunities, and how does that compare to whatever you're looking at? And, you know, my goal is to be as objective as I can, because there's going to be situations where the other opportunity is objectively better, right? And it's my job as a leader to say, you know, that actually is a better opportunity. You should, um, you should go for that. And I got lucky, like, the same person actually who the VP of sales who got me into sales, uh, when I was looking to join Cargurus, I was looking at the opportunity and uh, this guy's name was Rafi. And I was reporting directly to Rafi for the first time in my career. I was extremely happy there. Uh, Cargurus reached out with an opportunity. I told Rafi about it. I was like, look, I'm not looking, but I haven't interviewed in forever. I've been at the same company for like 13 years. I was like, if nothing else, let me sharpen my interviewing skill because I've interviewed like twice in my career. Um, went over there, turned out to be an amazing opportunity. And um, just the, the career development was something that I, I did not have at my current company. And even work with Rafi, who I knew had my back and had my best interests, those opportunities just didn't exist at that time in the company. And I remember sitting down with him and he's looking at the opportunity. He's like, look, if I'm your mentor and I'm your friend, like you have to take that job. And like, I am not going to take no for an answer. And I was approaching it from the other way. It's like, ah, I can't leave you. I can't leave the team we have. Like, I'm loyal to what we're doing here and I'm loyal to you. And we kind of had like this reverse battle where I was like, I want to stay here and I want to keep working with you. And he's like, no, you got to leave and you got to go to that other company because it's better for you. Uh, but to me, like, that was the best example I've seen in my career of a leader truly being selfless of, you know, I'd like to think that it was going to be a challenge to replace me and like there would be a gap and it would, you know, short term hurt him personally because it'd have to find a new manager and backfill and then all those things. We definitely got pretty far. And I honestly, I, I can relate to that. I've had some great leaders that have supported me and my decisions that I've made, even when I've left their company um, and I was contributing there amongst the top. And, you know, I think, I think it goes to show that, um, you know, people don't leave companies because of leadership. They leave for better opportunities to, for themselves. Um, and sometimes we do have to be a little bit selfish and think about ourselves and futures and, you know, figure out what's a better path for us. But um, I appreciate you sharing all this feedback with me, Mike. I think a lot of it helps, especially learning about attributes for success. I'm sure that's helping reduce attrition for you guys as a company. It gives your reps a goal to work towards them every single month. And they're getting, you know, graded on every month. They know what they need to work on and improve to help them get to that next level. Um, I agree with celebrating people, you know, going through promotions, leaving the company for maybe a better role or even getting promoted internally. I think that goes to show, especially for the next person stepping in and taking that role, that you know there is an opportunity for you to grow here. You really have, a, have an opportunity to grow, um, show your worth and, and have a rewards come out of it fruition. But at the same time, it might show that that person might have a really good territory and you should take it over because you might make a ton of money too. Um, so that's something there. So I think to cap off our conversation, it would be good to kind of give you know, our, our, our listeners and viewers here, some feedback on how they can prepare for a sales career, right? Um, there's a lot of people in sales, many of them never plan to be in it. You're a great example of it. I mean, how do we prepare for a sales career if you're thinking about getting into sales? Um, and then, you know, once you get into it, you know, how do we expand on that career growth perspective? But well, maybe we'll start with just preparing for sales and we'll get into that after. Yeah, so I think for preparation, it's funny you mentioned the Bryant program uh, at Cargurus. We we judge some competitions down there, and 
that was the first time I had been exposed to a college that was, you know, explicitly preparing people for a sales career because every person I know in my demographic in sales, we all ended up here accidentally, right? We all did something else first and you kind of, at some point or another, you fall into it and you're not really prepared for it, right? Because you never thought about that as a career path. I don't know of anyone in grade school, I remember saying like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, I'm going to be a salesperson, right? I'm, I'm going to go sling enterprise software. Like it, it just doesn't happen. Um, but it is, it is changing, right? Like there are programs around it. I think it, it, it's, it's great. It, it's everything we talked about promotions. I think it's the same thing for individual contributors, right? It's an opportunity to really understand what is a sales role and why do I want to do it? And why is it not slimy and not sleazy? And I don't have to be dishonest to do it. Um, you know, and they're learning much earlier than I did, like what sales actually is and um, how to do it with integrity. Uh, for people preparing, I think it's very simple for me is talk to as many salespeople as you can. Uh, luckily, salespeople tend to love to talk and they're usually very open to, to sharing their experiences. Um, but I would talk to as many different people as you can in, in different areas. You know, if you don't know people, jump on LinkedIn, make some connections. Again, I think the majority of people I've found in my career that, you know, have gotten into sales are very open and willing to helping others and share information and share their experiences. Um, and if you're unsure, try it. Because um, I think a lot of people have tried sales in their career. Um, one part of that being tapped on the shoulder story I didn't, change, or didn't share that I actually just uh, remembered was I initially said no. I, I said no many times. Um, but what actually finally got me over the finish line was the CEO of our company actually called me up. He's like, hey, like I, I hear you're thinking about a sales role. I was like, I'm not really thinking about it, but it's 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 been it's been thrown out there. Um, and one thing he told me, and this was 16 years ago and it still stuck with me, is every single person on our board has done sales at some point in their career. And you can do it and you can not like it. You can go back to engineering and go back and do something else. You can find something new. But the experience of having done that, you know, will, will, will give you a depth in your career and your experience that you're not going to get otherwise. And it, it was very interesting. You know, like if, if I think about our, our CRO, our chief marketing officer that had been a sales rep, our head of legal had been a sales rep, right? Like they all had this experience. That could be a coincidence. Uh, it could be a bias that our CEO loved hiring salespeople into, into different types of roles. But that really stuck with me that if I think about the things in my personal life I've gained from sales, right? About, I think, psychology and the ability to connect with people, you have all these benefits from sales that apply in all other parts of your life, professionally and personally, um, that if you're unsure, you know, give it a shot, like give it an honest shot, right? Like don't go in and just waste a company's time. But try it and, and see if you like it. And six months, a year, it doesn't work out. You know, walk away, no hard feelings. But you'll you'll probably have learned something about yourself. You probably would have grown yourself in some way, um, and you'll be better prepared for whatever comes next. You know, if it's not sales, fine. Uh, but if it's like me and you you try it, and I tried it probably as reluctantly as anyone has ever gotten into sales, and you know, within the first two weeks was. I love this. Like it's completely different than how I thought it was. Um, I love the ability to kind of have my own attack approach and my ability to control my day and the ability to control my income. And it was the first time in my career that I've been in a position that the harder that I work and the better I do, the more money I make. And that was really motivating for me. Um, so whatever your motivations are, you know, I think most people I know that have have tried it have enjoyed it. Some haven't. Um, but I would guess that they they probably don't regret it. I think they probably still learned and developed and whatever they ended up doing in their career probably still benefited them in some way. I like that a lot. I agree with you too. And you know, it's, it relates to me. I mean, I was a criminal justice major. I'm in sales now. <laughs> I love it. And, there you uh, go. I think a lot of what I've learned in school could really apply to sales in general. You just got to be, you know, be open to learning you have to be a sponge and come in every day with a mental positive mental attitude to, to really show up for yourself out there um, and have good conversations with clients. But Mike, I mean, this has been a great conversation here. I've, I've learned so much from you. Uh, I'm excited to apply some of the knowledge I've learned to what we're doing here today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And we're super excited to maybe do this in the future again. Uh -huh.